Greetings. Welcome to DAU's AI video learning series. Today we're going to investigate how AI learned to talk. And we're going to explore the evolution of neural networks to be being used as natural language processors. And we're going to take this all the way from recurrent neural networks, which we'll talk about and explain, all the way through transformer architectures. Now transformer architectures are those architectures behind ChatGPT and BARD and the Gemini models. So this is going to be a good one, so let's get to it. So, so far in this AI video learning series, we've discussed neural networks that were designed to do one thing. And they took an input in and immediately generated an output. So you remember this video, we use supervised learning to, dry, to train a simulated car to drive around a simulated track. And we would get a snapshot through its sensors in the front of the car. And then we'd take that and propagate through the neural network and a steering command would pop out the other side. Or else this video, how AI learns to see, where we taught the network to discriminate between various images that it was trained on. Or the video where we explained how an autoencoder zipped an image down to an encoded version and then decoded it or unzipped it right back up to its original form. Or even when we rearranged those into two networks, the generator and the discriminator, and we pitted them against each other in a kind of a boxing match, one getting better at generating images and the other one getting better at discriminating between those images, we still, it was trained to do one thing, and the inputs came in and generated immediately generated outputs. So in all these cases, inputs crop propagated straight through the network and generated the outputs. There was no capacity to make sense out of a sequence of data. Each input and output were independent from every other input and output. And I guess you could call this thinking, but in my mind, it's a primitive version of thinking, more like a gut feel or an intuition. The network just kind of knows the answer, kind of gets the feeling from its gut, if you will. There's no means for it to talk to itself or to reason through a problem. You know, when me and you work through a problem, we kind of do the, a little bit of self-talk and we maybe talk, talk ourselves through it. Uh, so that's really thought. And for AI to be able to do, th do that, it certainly has to first learn how to talk. To teach a network to talk, we first have to teach it how to deal with sequences of data. To do this, we'll take a single neuron from this network and we'll take that neuron, we don't need all the inputs, we'll just go ahead and take two of those inputs and we'll move it up here in the left, get it out of our way, and we'll determine the sentiment of movie reviews with our little recurrent neural network. If our review came back, that movie rocked. We'll take our little network here and we'll move that into our input. Now this input will, for the first word would be null, would be nothing, beginning of sequence. That generates an output, and then we call that output one. Now we, we don't immediately use that output, but the, but the network keeps an internal state, and it loops that around to that second input on the next timestamp, if you will. So this is time one, this is time two. So at time two, it kind of loops that output one, if you will, back around to that second input, and then it moves the next word in, movie, and then it generates output two. And again, that internal state is looped around to that second input on the next timestamp, and then rocked, rocked comes in the input. So rock comes in here, and then the output from the last time comes into the second input. And now we've, we've got all our inputs in, so we can actually generate a, a sentiment. And if it's trained correctly, it'll generate a thumbs up. And it used these internal states of the network to go ahead and keep track of the sequence. It kind of works the way we think our minds work, with an internal state of mind, if you will. And we call these recurrent neural networks. And if you ever see them in a diagram, they look something like this. This would be our single neuron. And this would be the loop back on itself, this loop over here. And then when we, when we unfold it, it's called unfolding, this would be our, our time one, this would be our time two, and our time three. And if we move our inputs in, that gives our output one, movie, our output two, rocks, and gives our sentiment our thumbs up. So RNN showed early promise for natural language processing. And back in the 80s, Michael Jordan, no, not that Michael Jordan, Air Jordan was probably about two years old. Uh, Michael Jordan, the prominent researcher, he looped portions of a neural network back on itself to create a state of mind, like we just saw in our little example. Uh, these three neurons over here, these guys, acted like a kind of memory, an internal state that was dependent on the past and could predict or affect the future. And he named these recurrent neural networks. He trained it on sequences of two repeating characters. And he did this by simply hiding the next character in the sequence and having the network guess it. Then the difference between the guess and the actual letter that was in the sequence, the truth data, 
uh, he used to generate a loss function and go back and, and adjust the network's parameters and help it better learn the sequence. And after he trained the network, he looped the output of the entire network back on in the input, and kicked it off with a single letter, and found that it would generate sequences that it had learned. And he noticed that initially it would make some mistakes, but then he would train it some more, and then it would get it right and be able to predict the patterns correctly. He trained this network to follow a pattern also. After he got done with the, sequ the letter sequences, he went ahead and, and made a slightly different network to, to follow this pattern. And after he trained it, it would follow this pattern. And even if he started it off of its normal pattern, he, he found out that it would work its way back to that original pa pattern and, and track that. And he concluded that when a network learns sequences, it essentially learns how to follow a trajectory through state space. So five years later, Jeffrey Elman, he used similar but slightly bigger versions of Jordan's networks and trained them on language. He used sentences uh, for training, and, but once again, he had the model predict the next character. He didn't provide the network with any word boundaries, and he was amazed when the model learned these boundaries on its own. So you can see in this graph right here, uh, it shows the chance of error. And notice at the beginning of a word, that chance of error is high. And then as the network gains confidence, it progresses down toward the end of the word, uh, the error goes down. And then as soon as it gets to another word, it snaps right back up again. Also, he noticed that uh, by analyzing the network's parameters internally, he could discover that the RNNs had effectively clustered similar types of words together. So the network learned patterns in the sequences of the words and grouped the words with similar meanings and similar functions. For example, nouns were grouped uh, separately from verbs and humans were grouped uh, separately from animals. And this it indicated really that the network was starting to understand different classes of words and showed uh, emergent linguistic understanding will develop uh, within the network just by predicting the next uh, character. And Elman found the network was able to understand and predict what kind of word would typically come next in a sentence. And that's a fundamental aspect of language comprehension and generation. So his little RNNs demonstrated the capability to generalize from their training data. So it didn't just memorize the data, they learned the underlying patterns in the, in the data in the sentences. This meant that after being trained on a set of sentences, the network could go ahead and generate new sentences that it had never encountered before. Similar sentences, but new and different from the ones it had been trained on. So this all happened during the dead of what's called the AI winter. You know, except for the small community of researchers that were involved in this area, their work largely went unnoticed for, for a while. Yashua Bengio made some pivotal contributions to AI and natural language processing. And he helped to thaw, him and his colleagues basically helped to thaw that AI winter. So in his 2003 paper, they advocated for neural networks to be used instead of n-gram statistical language methods that were popular at the time. Uh, n-grams are essentially word predictors. So they use the preceding word like, let's say, uh, peanut butter and you predict jelly. So that would be what's called a quadgram because there's four words involved. And there were many applications at the time for predicting the next word. And this is how linguists and industry were, was going. And, and Bengio and his team advocated that neural networks were the way, way to go. And, and he also advocated that the predict the next word should be used to train neural network uh, and make natural language models with them. NLPs today, like ChatGPT, those are trained to predict the next word on large quantities of data. He was pretty profound in 2003 when, he came, when they came up with this paper. So this course changing paper also popularized what's called word embeddings. Now in our simple little single neuron example, we glossed over the fact that neural networks can't really take words. You know, we put that movie rocked, uh, but really those would have to be numerical representations of words. And word embeddings are techniques that map words into numerical vector representations. So not just a single number, but a whole slew of numbers. Uh, you know, you can kind of, here's a three-dimensional representation of these words, and you can, it's hard for us to, to visualize beyond three or four dimensions. In, in word embeddings, uh, they really use multiple, multiple dimensions. So here's, here's some word embedding data I came up with just to show you. I was going to use a little example later on Jack and Jill went up the hill. So Jack, you know, it would be represented by all these numbers. So you can think of a vector as really a row in Excel in an Excel spreadsheet. And and you know these 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 word embeddings are huge. They're uh, like word to vec is a popular one. W O R D two V E C word to vec, and that can have anywhere from fifty elements to hundreds of elements for a single word. 
So word embeddings are these techniques that map these words into these numerical vector representations. By encoding words as multiple dimension numerical representations like this, they can capture a lot more than just the identity of the word. So representing words in this manner gives neural networks kind of a head start when it comes to learning context and meaning of words. And Bengio saw that sequences of words or sentences seem to follow a pathway through high dimensional space. So similar sentences with similar context and meaning would follow similar pathways. So you, from this little graphic, you can kind of think of, I know these are, this isn't a pathway, but if you had a whole sentence, it would follow a similar pathway. Two similar words would be kind of close to each other. So let's say Jack went up the hill, all right? And then if we had a similar sentence, um, Jill climbed the steep grade. You know, those two are similar. You know, Jack, a noun, a person went up a hill. Jill climbed a steep grade, very similar, so they should follow similar pathways through this multi-dimensional space. So jumping to 2011, you may recognize some of the names of some of these authors here. In many ways, this group of prominent researchers, they, they repeated the same experiment that Jordan and Elman did, uh, only this time a much larger and more sophisticated uh, recurrent neural network. They trained this larger network to, again, predict the next letter. Once again, they use the RNN to generate text by feeding its predictions back into the network's inputs so that it could be a generative network. And its performance was impressive. It generated linguistically coherent text. But after a point, the generated text would lose its coherence. Now, RNNs have an inherent problem with long passages of text. By the time they get to the end of a long passage, they start begin forgetting the beginning of that text. And when you kick off a neural network like this in a generative fashion, it's coherent for a while, but then it drifts off into gibberish. The researchers, though, speculated that scaling this network up would lead to better performance. So that was the next step. And then Andre Kapathy, he completed similar experiments in 2015, um, but he used LSTMs and GRUs to augment this time. So he did basically a version of it with an improved... Uh, an LSTM and a GRU are improved versions of RNNs. They help it remember more. And he trained his model on all of Shakespeare by predicting the next uh, character in Shakespeare. So he, he, Carpathy, when he got done, he found it generated content uh, that he could hardly tell from real Shakespeare. But even with LSTMs and GRUs, even though they improve the memory, uh, they still forget eventually. So if RNNs can remember, say, 100 words, then LSTMs and GRUs could remember, say, a thousand words. So eventually it would again drift off into the nonsensical if, if, when he looped it around to generate text. Style. So in 2017, our researchers at a relatively new nonprofit research lab uh, named OpenAI uh, built on Carpathy's work. And they trained what still may be the, the largest recurrent neural network ever uh, to once again predict the next character. And they trained it on this time on 82 million Amazon reviews. And their results were certainly impressive. Without specific training to determine sentiment, they found a neuron buried deep in the network that did just that. And they named it the sentiment neuron. And it precisely indicated the sentiment of the review. So you'd feed it a review and it would pop positive or negative, whether it was a, a positive or a negative review. Remember that little example we did earlier with our single neuron? You know, that, that was a grossly trivial example. You would certainly need a much bigger network than that to do this. But this was, this was something industry was very interested at the time and had been spending lots of money to do this. And here are these guys just training it on existing Amazon reviews. A neuron popped up that would perfectly predict sentiment. And even more amazingly is they could force that neuron so they could loop the, the outputs of the network back on the inputs and make it a generative model again, but then they could force that neuron positive or negative and it would generate positive reviews if it was forced positive that were indistinguishable from a human generated uh, review or they could force it negative and likewise it would generate a negative review. They really wanted to train it on a more inclusive data set and again a bigger uh, network would likely yield big, bigger results but, but they're really reaching the limits of what RNNs could do and even LSTMs and GRUs. They, they, they just you know they couldn't get past the memory boundary where they'd start forgetting after a thousand words for uh, L LSTMs and GRUs, and also because of their serial and sequential nature, RNNs really didn't parallelize well. That means you couldn't just throw a lot of GPUs at them to speed up the training. Now luckily that same year, OpenAI had made that RNN with the sentiment neuron, 
a group of researchers at, at Google that had teamed up with the University of Toronto, they published a paper that would revolutionize natural language processing. They introduced the aptly named transformer architecture in the aptly named paper entitled Attention is All You Need. So this is figure one from that paper. So transformers brought three key things together for natural language processing. Uh, unlike the models we discussed so far, this model ingests the entire input prompt all at once into you know, everything in the context window, whether it's two or three or four sentences or a paragraph or however big it is, that all comes in at once in parallel. And so position information has to be encoded on top of that so that the model knows in which order those words uh, fall in the sentences. This is a big advantage over recurrent neural networks that brought things in sequentially one at a time. It makes it a lot more efficient, a lot more scalable, and it allows for faster training. So number two is self-attention and multi-headed self-attention in particular. So you can think of self-attention as the secret sauce of that transformer architecture. So imagine each word in the input sequence has its own little apparatus that it can use to investigate both itself and every other word in that entire input sequence to determine its importance and every other word's importance relative to it. So it's kind of like giving each word its own little mini brain to figure out its importance and every other word's importance. And really the mini brain is a very shallow but wide neural network. And all these individual perspectives, because each word gets its own version of this, all these individual perspectives get smashed together and handed off to the feed forward network. And that smashed together input or output is the output from one of those self-attention heads. But remember, this is multi-headed self-attention, and in the original model, they had eight self-attention heads. So each of those eight self-attention heads gets its own unique view on that entire input sequence, its own unique, pulls different facets out of it that it thinks are important. All of those eight different attention heads, those then get uh, added together and added to the feed-forward network. And the feed-forward network is what pulls out the nuanced, nuanced context and figures out the real meaning of that input, what it really means. So here's where that multi-headed attention happens. And then that is handed off and then all eight of those heads would get added together, normalized, and then handed off to the feed-forward network. So let's see if we can appreciate what self-attention is really doing. So I retrieve my money from the bank. Okay, as speakers of English, we see I retrieved, and we know it's money from the bank. So we really don't have to spend much time trying to figure out the, the meaning of that sentence. We just know, and we probably didn't think that. But that would have been a perfectly valid interpretation of I retrieved my money from the bank. Uh, we probably thought that instantly, right? So let's take one more of these. I sat on the bank and counted my money. So bank and, and money, again, probably not this. Probably didn't sit on that bank and count money because that's happened very often. We probably went right to that. So that those, those different attention heads push all those perspectives added together to that feed forward network and it learns what the real meaning of that is as it goes about predicting the next word during training. And when it gets it wrong, all those parameters get adjusted, and eventually it learns uh, what those the real context and the nuanced, nuanced meaning of, of those sentences are. Okay, so the third important thing is word embeddings. And word em these weren't just the word embeddings like we talked about and we showed in the example of Excel spreadsheet. These word embeddings are actually learned right along with the parameters of the model. Remember our Jack and Jill example, we had Jack and then we had the whole role of, of inputs in the Excel spreadsheet and all those numbers represented Jack. Well, in this case, in the transformer architecture, all those numbers would be randomized for the start at the beginning before it was trained. And then those numbers that represented Jack would be learned right along with the parameters of the model. So these are learned word embeddings. All right, so you remember the group at OpenAI that had just made the big recurrent neural network. They trained on the Amazon reviews and found the sentiment neuron. Well, they wanted to train on a more inclusive data set and they would have loved a bigger model but they were up against the stops of the, of the limits of the recurrent neural network and training that. Well, that same year they put that paper out, this attention is all you need paper came out and they saw this and they realized, Eureka, this is what we need for our, for our model. So they could repeat the experiment again and do it this time with the transformer. But they looked at that original transformer architecture and if you remember, there was two sides to it. 
there was a left side and a right side. Well, that original model was designed to translate from one language to another. And the left side would be the, the language to translate from. So say we put in English, English would come in and it would get encoded. And then the right side would decode it into the language to be translated to. So maybe English to French, and then French would come out the right side. Well, OpenAI saw that and said, we don't need all that. So they basically just took one side of the model. Sometimes it's called a decoder only model, but don't let that mix you up because it encodes and decodes, but it does it all on what was originally known as the decoder side of that model. So let's walk through their model. It still inputs the entire input. So whatever's in the context window, that entire input, be it a sentence, two sentences, three sentences, whatever, that goes into the input. All right, but now it's all done in parallel. It's all given to it at once in parallel. So it has to have positional encoding added to it. And this is almost like modulation. So like positional modulation that you put on top of it that lets the model know what order the words come in. And then the attention layers work as we just discussed, you know, adding the self-attention, the multi-headed self-attention, mashing those together, giving it to the feed forward network. The feed forward makes good sense out of it. And it goes on to try to predict the next word, figure out what the most probable next word is in the sequence, maps that probable word to the vocabulary, puts it back into English, if you will, and generates it around. And if it's not the end of sequence, you know, if it's not the last word, it it auto-regressively puts it back around to the input. So let's say we had our Jack and Jill went up the, it would position and code it, get the multi-headed attention, get the feed forward network to figure out the nuances, better predict the next word, predict the next word, which is probably hill if it's already trained. And then hill would be auto-regressively fed right back in. And now that becomes part of the context window. So hill gets added to the input. And now that whole thing, Jack and Jill went up the hill is now added and it repeats the whole thing again and two comes around and then two would add repeats it fetch fetch would get added in a pail of water and so on and so on it would keep auto regressively feeding it around until it got to an end of sequence marker and that in a nutshell is how the gpt works OpenAI wanted to do a bigger model that became known as GPT-1. And GPT-1 was certainly bigger. It had 117 million weights. That's 117 million knob settings or parameters. And now this model, this GPT-1, it had 12 layers. And each of those 12 layers had 12 attention heads in each layer. So a layer, imagine this, as this is one layer. So 12 would be, N sub X would be 12. So there would be 12 of these, and then each of those layers in itself would have 12 attention heads. And they train this model on the books corpus, which is a data set of about 7,000 books. So that initial training phase is called the pre-training phase, and that's where it tries to predict the next word as it, as it goes through all these books. When it gets the loss function, it adjusts all the parameters like we talked about. But then after, after that pre-training, it's followed up with a relatively small amount of supervised training uh, on some really high quality data, and that's called fine tuning. So that fine tuning helps better shape the performance on particular tasks and in, in, in styles of language. So this unsupervised or what some call semi-supervised pre-training step where it trolls this huge amount of data, uh, all the books in this case, um, that's called the pre-training phase, and then that's followed up with a fine-tuning phase on higher quality data uh, to get the, LL, the large language models to behave uh, in a manner that you'd really like them to behave in. So when they got done with all this, they looked at the results, and the results were certainly impressive to say the least. It would generate re uh, text in, in its response that was very coherent and more coherent than they'd seen in any prior experiments. And it also showed the ability to answer some questions that it hadn't even seen in training. Now this phenomenon is known as zero shot. They tested it in 12 different areas and in nine of those 12 areas, they had state-of-the-art results. They were pretty impressed and they immediately re they realized that bigger is gonna be better. So they immediately scaled it up again and got a bigger data set, which became known as GPT-2. Now GPT-2 had 1.5 billion parameters and 48 layers. So 48, N sub X was 48, 48 of these stacked from one on top of each other serial, trained it in the same manner, predicting the next word on yet a still bigger data set. 
Now OpenAI wanted to ensure quality, so they went ahead and scraped the internet for the text to train it on, and it's basically a large chunk of the public web. When they got done, they did the pre-training, they did the fine-tuning, then they tested it for reading comprehension, for answering questions, for summarizing, and for language translation. Now they'd never trained this specifically to be to translate language, so they hadn't even specifically trained it to be a translator, but it was able to translate. They wanted to scale up even further and get yet a bigger data set. And voila, a year later, we have GPT-3. So GPT-3, they made 100 times bigger, 175 billion parameters. They had 96 layers. And within each of those layers, they had 96 separate attention heads. So 96 layers stacked end to end to end. And in each of those, 96 attention heads. And they made the context window bigger also. And it was trained on nearly the entire internet. And when OpenAI saw the resulting performance, they knew they really had something. In addition to doing better on everything we'd already talked about that GPD-1 and GPT-2 did, they also saw what's called in-context learning. So you could actually teach it something in the context window. The weights were all frozen. We weren't adjusting the parameters, but yet it learned something new in that context window. And so they knew they had something. So they used reinforcement learning from human feedback. So if you've ever used ChatGPT and you've given it a thumbs up or a thumbs down, you might have been training it. You might have been using reinforcement learning from human feedback. Well, they did some of that to better shape the answers. And they made what's called Instruct GPT. Instruct GPT became ChatGPT, which they released in November of 2022. And to say that that shocked the world is probably a bit of an understatement. 2023. GPT-4 came out, and GPT-4, OpenAI is not so open anymore, so they don't really know the details on GPT-4. However, we believe it's about 1.75 trillion parameters. The performance is definitely impressive. I can attest to that myself personally. So the impressive results of the GPT series, some of which you can see on the left side over here, this is uh, its performance against a number of different tests. Uh, the number of users just skyrocketed like crazy. Uh, some say it passed the Turing test. It's hard to pass the Turing test, though, when the computer says, I am just a large language model. I am not a person. Uh, remember, the Turing test was to be able to be indistinguishable from a person when you talk to it. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, it maybe broke the Turing test. Uh, as you say, uh, other companies, basically there was a gold, they, a gold rush to, to build bigger models or to at least catch up to chat GPT and, and what they did. And, and all these models that you, you've heard about, probably Bard and, and Llama and Claude and now Gemini that Google just introduced recently, these are all uh, transformer models and all large language transformer models um, that have, have made the headlines recently. So that in a nutshell, is the 30,000 foot view explanation of how AI has learned to talk. We've just scratched the surface on what these models can do, and I'd love to, you know, want to do that on the next video. But I really wish I could pause and answer questions here. If you have any questions, please put them in the comments, and we'll, we'll answer them as best we can. In our next video, we'll dive deeper into these amazing models. We'll talk more about large language models and how they're trained. We'll look at what they really consist of. We'll talk about how multimodal capability uh, is going to help them to be able to solve general purpose problems if they're not already doing that. Uh, we'll discuss other types of transformer models besides LLMs like AlphaFold. And we'll take a peek at what the future might hold for this area. So that next video is not to be missed. Please keep an eye out for it. If you'd like to take any of DAU's AI courses and earn credit toward an official AI training credential, please click here. And if for whatever reason that click doesn't work, and in the comments below, you'll find a link to that. Thanks again for watching. Please check out the other videos in our series. And please, if you like that, please go ahead and hit a thumbs up and uh, go ahead and subscribe so you don't miss that next video.